show a monkey to the average person and he immediately begins to laugh. Monkeys appear so human and they have a look of such serious concentration on what they're doing that they parody mankind. We must either laugh at them or be horrified at a living caricature of ourselves. And so in self-defense we laugh and regard monkeys tolerantly as objects of amusement. But their likeness to human beings is much more than skin deep and from their history we can trace our own origins. In the wild, monkeys are creatures of strength and grace. Through living in the trees, the first monkeys grew serviceable hands to help them in their journeys through the branches. Some, in the forests of the New World, strengthened their tails until they became a fifth limb, strong enough to support the whole weight of their bodies. As the ages passed, some monkeys, like the baboons, grew big and came down from the trees to live on the ground. Here they had to reckon with more enemies and different problems from those of the treetops. For defense and attack, they came to rely more and more on their hands and on the well-developed brains which life in the trees had given them. Baboons are fond of each other's company and live together in large packs. They love the sunshine and on a fine day the whole colony will be busily engaged in grooming. They are not hunting for fleas, but for loose pieces of skin, thorns and so on, and they also pull out hairs. It stimulates the nerves of their skin, and they obviously get a great deal of pleasure from it, just as a man does from massage or a woman from beauty treatment. This urge to groom is tremendously strong in all monkeys, and is one of the main reasons why they live together in packs. In their packs, baboons have a definite social order arranged like our own. Each colony is made up of a number of families, and each family is under the leadership of an adult male. He has one or more females attached to him, and probably several children. These families, which may remain together year after year, are the basic units of all monkey society. Early travelers brought home strange tales of these baboon colonies. Richard Jobson, a merchant who traveled through Ethiopia in 1620, wrote, It is a wonderful thing to observe a kind of commonwealth that is amongst them. They have none but their own kind together, and are in herds of three or four thousand in a company. And as they travel, they go in rank, whereof the leaders are certain of the greater sort, the smaller following. And every now and then, as a commander, a great one walks. The females carry their young under their bellies, and the young baboon can use its hands as soon as it's born to cling tightly to its mother's fur. Apart from this, it's quite helpless. Young monkeys are usually born only one at a time. Through five or six years of childhood, they stay with their families, and their parents and the older children are always at hand for protection and help. This slow period of growth gives the young animals plenty of time for education. As they get older, they play with the other youngsters of the colony. In their games, they learn the full use of their hands and control of their muscles and limbs and attempt the various activities of the adults around them. While the young ones play, the adults sit quietly alone or in family parties. The yawn of a baboon does not usually mean boredom. It is more often the sign of aggression or threat. The big male is the master of each family group. His will is backed by the strength of his teeth and arms and is only disputed when his strength fails. He will drive weaker animals away from food and if two baboons are kept in a cage, the dominant male will get most of the food and the other will starve. Baboons have pouches in their cheeks into which they stuff the food until a convenient opportunity occurs to eat it. The overlord guards jealously the unity of his family. He attacks at once any other male who shows too much interest in his females. Higher in the scale come the anthropoid apes, 
tailless and with bigger brains than the monkeys. Of these man-like creatures, the only ones which live completely in the trees are the gibbons. They are the most graceful of all animals. Gay and lively, wonderfully agile, they use their long arms to swing through the branches with amazing freedom. On their rare descents to the ground, they walk erect and are the only mammals besides men which habitually walk on two feet. Their arms reach to the ground when they stand up and are longer in proportion to the body than in all the other apes. Gibbons are probably extremely intelligent, but their volatile temperament makes it very difficult to find out. In the early morning, the jungles of Malay and southern China are said to ring with the shrill chorus of the gibbons as they leave their sheltered sleeping places. to approach human standards in the larger man-like apes such as the orangutan. So human are these great apes that at one time they were thought to be a race of savage people. The name orangutan means wild man of the woods. As night approaches, the apes build nests in the trees to sleep in. These nests are not permanent homes, they are only slept in once and next morning the family moves on to new feeding grounds. Liveliest and most sociable of the anthropoids are the chimpanzees. But in spite of their varied behavior, in their wild state they make little effort to use their intelligence. They take their surroundings as they find them, and their only attempt at constructing anything is the nests which they build at night. They live in the same family groups as the monkeys, but their packs are much smaller. Each family is dominated by an adult male. <coughs> In captivity, the human being replaces the dominant male and the normal impulses of the animals can be suppressed so long as a keeper is at hand and they can learn to behave like men and women, more or less. Their diet, like that of all monkeys and apes, is almost entirely vegetarian. At a meal like this, where they have to behave themselves, each gets his fair share of food. But there is little doubt that if the keeper's back were turned, the big male would have most of it. Apes, like the monkeys, take a tremendous interest in the fur of other animals. This instinct shows itself in captivity in a passion for investigating articles of clothing. Shoes, particularly, attract some apes. In taking off a man's shoe, the chimpanzee shows a command of hand and eye far beyond the ability of a young human child. But it hasn't the constructive intelligence to put it on again.
The chimpanzee shows more than instinct. Like a man, it uses insight in solving problems. Place an attractive morsel of food, say a cup of ice cream, out of reach of its arms, and it'll use a stick to get at it. If one stick is not long enough, chimpanzees have been known to fit two together for the purpose. They appear to solve a problem like this, not just by trial and error, as a cat or a chicken might, but by studying the situation as a man would, and working out the solution. Although the apes can be taught to make themselves useful, they soon get tired of anything like work. No one has yet been able to train them to do dull work for very long, except when there's an audience to encourage them. Chimpanzees love showing off, and if their tricks are not sufficiently appreciated, they'll lead the applause themselves. No one has yet taught an ape to speak more than two or three words, and one word took six months. Yet they have a wide vocal range and a definite feeling for sound and rhythm. In anger or excitement, they will beat rhythmically with hands and feet on any surface which makes a noise. a primitive dance. Somewhere here lies the secret of mankind's passion for dancing and the beat of dance music. Still larger, more terrifying man-like creatures, rejoicing in the shadows of the woods and fleeing from intercourse with men. Like the other apes, but in different ways, the gorillas resemble men. These pongos, said one traveler in the 17th century, are in all proportion like a man, but are more like giants in stature. They cannot speak and have no understanding more than a beast. Many times they fall upon the elephants which come to feed where they be and so beat them with their clubbed fists and pieces of wood that the elephants will run roaring away from them. At some time in the far past, some such creature as this developed speech and became man. Man could speak. He could communicate with his fellows. He left the forests and lived in the open. He changed his habits of feeding. Unlike the apes, he no longer accepted his world as he found it. With his brain and hands and tongue, he shaped it to please himself. He imposed his own ways of life on his world, built his own surroundings, created a multitude of machines to do his will. He harnessed the elements for transport and communication. The physical world became his servant. But in all the complexity of a man-made world, the family remains the root of society just as it was amongst the apes and the monkeys. In our families, we spend the impressionable years of childhood. In our family circle, we learn the behavior of civilized life. We learn to keep our bodies well and fit with healthy exercise, 
we learn how important it is to take pride in our outward appearance. Before our eyes, we have the constant example of our parents encouraging us to conduct ourselves with dignity in our dealings with the world around us. For when we take our place in the stream of active life, we find the community vast and disordered and complex. But the family circle, remaining constant year after year, is the one stable thing in our shifting society. The family is the highest achievement in the history of life. <laughs>